we're going to continue on verse 7 of 1 Samuel chapter 30. And David said to Abiathar the priest, Elimelech's son, I pray thee, bring me hither the Ephrath. And Abiathar brought thither Imbrod to David. Now, I showed what that Ephrod means. It was, it was, uh, it was supposed to be a divine guidance, uh, something that the priests used. The, the, the Levites they would carry and it's supposed to show them the divine guidance of the Lord but we don't have the ephod that, and the ephod back then really didn't do it but that's what they carried but our ephod today is the Holy Spirit when we seek God's will for whatever we seek God's Holy Spirit that's our ephod for today for this for now David seeks God's will on what to do from here on and God is good God is good. We just saw how bad David was. Pretty bad. We just saw how bad he was. Everything that David has messed up on, now he's back, he's repented, he's come back to the Lord, and the Lord is what? He's ready. Every time we walk away from the Lord, we walk away from the Lord. The Lord don't walk away from us. Every time we walk away, he's waiting. He just waits for us. And that's what David did. David came back to the Lord, and now... The Lord is ready to get continue into David's life on what to do. To show David what to do. So David repented and came back. And in verse 8, And David inquired at the Lord, saying, Shall I pursue after this troop? Shall I overtake them? And he answered him, Pursue, for thou shalt surely overtake them, and without fail recover all. Now this is what the Lord told David. He says, Yeah, go after these men that have taken... The, the families go after them and he said not only go after them but you won't fail on the recover all so everything they've taken God's told David you're going to get it all back and this had to be very encouraging to David to be able to go to the father after everything he's done be able to go to the father and the father answer him and say yes now that you're back with me I can start using you again amen, amen. when we walk away from the Lord the Lord can't use us right. when you're not walking with him he can't use you but when we are walking in the Spirit, that's when He uses us. And this is one of those prayers that the Lord answered right away. And the reason the Lord answered this prayer right away, I'll show you later. Because some, some prayers, you know, you ask the Lord, you know, what do I do? You know, how many times do we have to wait and see? Sometimes the Lord answers a prayer right away, sometimes He doesn't. But He will answer the prayer. And sometimes we don't see that prayer answered because he didn't answer it the way we wanted it. So since he didn't do it the way we wanted it, we take it that he didn't answer our prayer. Here, God said, no, go get them. Go recover all of it. In verse 9, So David went, he and the 600 men that were with him, and came to the brook Basar. Here, those that were left behind stayed. Now look what happened. Back in verse 6, the men, remember, Last week, the men were ready to kill David because the families were taken, their families were taken, and they were ready to kill David. Remember that? And now they're right here, and they're ready to go to battle with him. Why? Because they saw David repent. They saw David get back with the Lord. That's what they saw. And now they're ready to follow him again. Not only did David encourage and strengthen himself, but... Because of his actions, his men followed. When you're walking with the Lord and other people see it, that's an encouragement for them. We have to walk a Christian walk. We are witnesses, whether we know it or not, we are witnesses. We're either good or bad witnesses. But we are witnessing to other people. When you claim to be born again Christian, you are witnessing. Because people will look at you. In verse 10, But David pursued he and 400 men, for two hundred abode behind, which were so faint that, that they could not go over the brook Basar. Now these men would have went because that's what mighty warriors do. No matter how tired they are, they would have went. But they stayed behind. But we'll see in verse 21, it says, And David came to those two hundred men, which were so faint that they could not follow David, whom they had made. David made them also to abide there at the brook. So he made these men to stay there. Even though, you know, mighty warriors, they go to, they can't go no more, they drop. But David said, no, I want y'all to stay right here. And 
That's why they stayed. In verse 11, And they found an Egyptian in the field, and brought him to David, and gave him bread, and he did eat. And they made him drink water, and they gave him a piece of cake of figs, and two clusters of raisins. And when he had eaten, his spirit came again to him. For he had eaten no bread, nor drunk any water, three days and three nights. And David said unto him, To whom belongest thou? And whence art thou? And he said, I am a young man of Egypt, servant to a Hamalakite, and my master left me, because three days ago I fell sick. And see the works of God. David and his men left Philistine. If you remember from last week, they left three days ago. This guy was left by his king three days ago. And now here they are together. We're going to see if this is a coincidence. <laughs> uh, see, let's see if this is a coincidence. In verse 14, we made an invasion upon the south of the Sherifites and upon the coast which belonged to Judah and upon the south of Caleb and we burned Ziklag with fire. And David said to him, Canest thou bring me down to this company? And he said, Swear unto me by God that thou wilt neither kill me nor deliver me into the hands of my master, and I will bring thee down to this company. Now he trusts David. He says, and He will do it if you swear to God. Because, you know, back then, everybody knew about the Israel's God. Everybody knew about Jehovah God. Because he was always with Israel most of the time when they were walking with him. Now sometimes we know that Israel went into battle, that God didn't send them, and they were defeated. But when God would send them, they always came out victorious. So they, everybody knew about Israel's God. And he said, by your, by your God, swear to me you won't tell my master. This is what this guy is saying. In verse 16, And when he had brought him down, behold, there were spread abroad upon all the earth, eating and drinking and dancing because of all the great spoil that they, had, that they had taken out of the land of the Philistines and out of the land of Judah. Now there was, there were spread abroad upon all the earth. What this is saying is there were thousands and thousands of men. There were just, there were so far, I mean, spread abroad, there were so many of them. There were, it's saying there was thousands and thousands of men. David has four, 400 men. Remember, two stayed behind. 400 came with him. And David didn't say, uh, we better go get the other 200. No. With his 400 men, because who told him to go? God, God told him to go. He didn't, look, he didn't look with these eyes. Hey, wait a minute. There's thousands and thousands and thousands. And there's only 400 of us. Did David look with his, with his physical eyes? No. God told him to and he went. That's the way we need to live. If David would have been by himself, he would have defeated this army. Because God told him to go. And God told him, you will recover everything. The reason I say that is because look at Samson. Samson killed a thousand men. Just one man, Samson, killed a thousand men with a jawbone of a, of a, of a donkey. That's all he had was a jawbone of a donkey. And one man, Samson, a man of God, killed a thousand Philistines. So that's what I'm saying. If David would have went by himself, God would have seen him through it. This is our God. This is our God. you gotta, you got to look at it with your spiritual eyes. Look what our God can do. Amen. It looks totally out. No way, no way, no way. But God says, I'm with you. Amen. I'm with you. If I said go, then I'm with you and you will have victory. And these men had it. Samson had it. David had it. And not only that, uh, Samson, when he brought down the temple in Judges 16.30, the, what do you call them, the pillars? Pillar. When he brought them down, well, right before he brought them down, he said, you know, take my life with these Philistines. It says he killed as many, and that one time, he killed as many as he did all his life. Just one man. So that's why I'm saying if David went to this battle by himself against all those thousands, he would have won. Because what God told him. We got to believe that. We got to believe no matter what the number is, no matter what we see with these eyes, if God said do it, we do it. 
Without faith, it is impossible to please God. And remember back in Exodus 32, the people got tired of waiting on, on, for Moses to come down from the mountain. They told Aaron to make, him a gold, to make them a golden calf. Remember that when he went up to get the Ten Commandments? And in verse 6, it says, verse 6, it says that the people were eating and drinking. Just like these men up these these men up here, these thousands and thousands, they were eating and drinking. They were eating and drinking, rose up to play, meaning dancing, and other things, which we know that, you know, they they just totally got away from the Lord, those the Jews. When Moses went up, he took too long. So the Jews just started partying. Hey, make make us a golden calf so we can worship that golden calf. Because God has brought us out here and He's just left us here. That's what they were thinking. And so Aaron made them a golden calf and they worshipped it. And they were eating and drinking and partying. And let me read the, the Living Bible what happened when the, when the people turned from God. I'm going to read Exodus 32 verses 25 through 29. Moses saw that Aaron had let the people get completely out of control much to the amusement of their enemies. So he stood at the entrance to the camp and shouted, All of you who are the Lord's side, come here and join me. And all the Levites gathered around him. Moses told them, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Each of you, take your sword and go back and forth from one end of the camp to the other. Kill everyone, even your brothers, friends and neighbors. The, Le the Levites obeyed Moses' command and about 3,000 people died that day. Then Moses told the Levites, Today you have ordained yourselves for the service of the Lord, for you obeyed even though it meant killing your own sons and brothers. Today you have earned a blessing. Now because of what happened, the Lord wanted, the, wanted them, the ones who didn't take Moses' side, he had the ones that did take Moses out. He went. He had them go and kill everybody. I don't care if they're your brothers. I don't care if they're family. He said, "Kill them." Now this is the Lord. This is when you're not with the Lord. When you're not with the Lord, and I can show you several places, you're an enemy of God. I've shown y'all several times before. When you're not with the Lord, you're an enemy of God. If you're not a born again Christian, you're an enemy of God. And, it, and I mean, it's, it's this verse is saying. Here, it was a physical killing. What they did here in Moses' time, this, what they did was a physical killing. And believe it or not, Jesus said the same thing in the New Testament. In the New Testament, he says the same thing. But this is a spiritual killing he's talking about. The, what I just read in Moses was a physical one. They physically killed these people, the families, everything. In the New Testament, Matthew chapter 10 verses 32 through 38 it says everyone who acknowledged me publicly here on earth I will also acknowledge before my father in heaven but everyone who denies me here on earth I will also deny before my father in heaven don't imagine that I came to bring peace to the earth I came not to bring peace but a sword what's a sword the Word of God I have come to set a man against his father a daughter against her mother and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. Your enemies will be right in your own household. If you love your father or mother more than you love me, you are not worthy of being mine. If you love your son or daughter more than me, you are not worthy of being mine. So the Lord, bottom line right here, He's saying anybody, anybody you put before God, then that's who your Lord is. God comes before everyone. Father, mother, brothers, he comes before everyone. And if you're, if you're a person and you listen to your mother, father, whoever, whatever family, more than you do the Lord, then that is your Lord. And God says, I don't, you know, I don't know you. Because I've given you the verses that, that said, there'll be Christians that say, then we say, Lord, Lord, and then we do this in your name, and then we do that in your name, and the Lord's going to say, depart from me, I never knew you. And he's talking about religious people here that did all these things, 
and they're going and God's going to say depart from me I never knew you did you put your mother before me did you put your father before me did you put the church before me whatever anything whatever you put before me then that was your God and that's what he's saying right here in Matthews in verse 17 and David smote them from twilight evening unto the evening the next day and there escaped not a man of them except 400 young men which rode upon camels and fled now they fought from twilight which meant <clears throat> in the evening not in the morning met in the evening because they weren't eating and drinking and dancing first thing in the morning so they they started fighting from evening afternoon to the next afternoon they fought for 24 hours that's how long they fought and in verse 18 and David recovered all that the Elamanites had carried away, and David rescued his two wives. And there was nothing lacking to them, neither small nor great, neither sons nor daughters, nor, nor, neither spoils nor anything that had taken to them. David recovered all. We see the reason why David couldn't wait on those other two men, 200 men. Because when, when it says they were lacking nothing, now, they took all the women, the wives, remember? The families. You get thousands of men getting drunk, partying, getting drunk. What's going to happen tonight, that night, with the women that they've taken away? You can imagine what's going to happen. These are, these are prisoners, these are slaves now, and these thousands of men are, get, are getting drunk. It's going to happen. So David had, that's why the Lord answered the prayer right then and there. He says, no, I need you to go now. Go and do that. And that's why he was able to say it. They were able to say, and there was nothing lacking of them. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. Those men wasn't able. Those men weren't able, weren't didn't have time to, to uh, take the respect of the women away from them. Because once a woman gets raped, what happens? She loses her respect. She loses everything. So that's why he said, "Go now before this happens." And they were lacking in nothing. They recovered all. Recovered all. And that's what God said in verse 8, right? That you would recover all. So he got every, everything they took, he recovered all. Can we believe God when he speaks to us? When he speaks to us in a still small voice or, or when he speaks to us in the word? Can we believe him? He spoke to David. Did he speak to David like I'm speaking to y'all? Back then they used prophets. They used prophets. Prophets would... He would speak to the prophets and the prophets would tell the kings or who were like David, Saul, for a little while. Uh, that's the way they, got, they heard from God. Well, we don't have kings. We're not under kings like they were back then. Again, we're back to the Holy Spirit. We have the Holy Spirit to hear from. The Holy Spirit leads us on what to do and what not to do. And that's, that's how we live today. Back then they had the prophets. And there is prophets today. But many of them are false prophets. Many of them. Many of them are false. I've seen one myself. And the Bible says they're going to be here. They're going to be here. I've seen the false prophet. I knew he was false because what he was doing in that church was not, was not in the Bible. This was something he was doing. He was making a show. He was trying to impress the people on what he could do. Now, if he was to do this back in Jesus' time, back in Jesus' time, if you said you were a prophet and whatever you prophesied didn't come, come about, they stoned you to death. And if they did that today, we wouldn't have too many men out there saying, hey, I'm a prophet. Right. But they are out there. In verse 20, And David took all the flocks and the herbs which they drove before those other cattle and said, This is David's spoil." David, David didn't keep everything for himself. He could have kept everything because he's a king. He could have kept everything for himself. But we're going to see what he did with it. He's back with the Lord, right? So we're going to see what he did with all the, with everything they had taken. We're going to see what, what he's going to do with it. And verse 21, And David came to the 200 men which were so faint that they could not follow David, whom they had made also to abide at the brook Basar. And they went forth to meet David and to meet the people that were with him. And when David came near to, to the people, he saluted them. Then answered all the wicked men. Now, they weren't wicked like in the laws. The way that we're going to see the way they were thinking was wicked. 
Then answered all the wicked men of Belial, of those that went with David, and said, Because they went not with us, saying, Because they didn't go into battle with us, they're saying, We will not give them aught of the spoil that we have recovered, except to every man his wife and his children, that they may lead them away in the port. Now, wicked men, these men were selfish. Like I said, you know, we, Christians have selfishness. You know, we have to give it to the Lord. We need to learn not to be. But right here, these men, now these men following David, a man of God, they followed him. And they were with him. And they followed him. As David was following the Lord, what was making, they, they also followed the Lord. They wanted to get all they could get out of it. And we have that today. People try to get it all they can get out of whatever. They want as much as they can get. Remember, these men were commanded by David to stay back. David commanded these men to stay back. They didn't stay back because they were scared or couldn't. David commanded them to stay back. So that's when they came back. David said, okay, they're going to get some of this spoil also. But it's going to continue. Not only these men, but we're going to see what a man of God will do when he's walking with the Lord. Verse 23. Then say then said David, Ye shall not do so, my brethren, with that which the Lord hath given us, who hath preserved us, and delivered the company that came against us into our hand. And like I said, now David's walking with the Lord. He answers them as a Christian should. He says, My brothers, don't be selfish with what the Lord has given us, with what the Lord has given us. You know, people think, Oh, I got, I got that. Christians. You know, because of whatever, that's what I got. Jody and I, we know everything that's that we have is from the Lord. Jody and I will not sit there and say, this is all mine. This is because of me. She knows because of what we have, it comes from God. And that's the way we should be. If whatever we have comes from the Lord. If you're a born-again Christian and you're walking with Him. He was reminding them where these spoils came from. You know, all these goods. And he said they came from the Lord. They came from the Lord. A lot of times, we don't feel that way. A lot of times, like Jody, and I'm, I'm just going to have to use her as an example. She went to college. She got degrees in, in chemical engineering. You know, and she's smart and everything. She's got a good job. But is she does is she taking all the credit upon herself? Does she? Well, y'all don't know. Y'all don't live with her. <laughs> but she does, and she knows. She knows her bless. Those blessings have come from the Lord. She was blessed to be able to study that way and be able to go to school. She was blessed to find a job. What I'm trying to show is give whatever you have, whatever we have, is from the Lord. It's not because you're, you're great whatever. Yeah. It's from the Lord. It's not from your family. It's not from your schooling. It's from the Lord. If you have it, it's from the Lord. David doesn't give himself any credit here. Look what I did. Or look what me and my men did. He's giving all the credit to the Lord. Look what God has given us. That's what he's saying. He could have done that. Look what me and my men did. But he didn't. A man of God won't do that. Verse 24. For who will hearken unto you in this matter? But as his part is that goeth down through the battle, so shall his part be that tarry by the stuff they shall put shall part alike. David's telling these men, who's going to agree with you on this matter? Not to give them anything. And y'all and y'all get it all. Nobody's going to agree with it. Those who went into battle, he said, will get their part. But those who stayed behind and took care of their equipment or watched over whatever, whatever they had to wash over, they're going to get their part too, is what David's telling them. And in verse 25, and it was so, f and it was so from that day forward, that he made a statue and, and an ordinance for Israel unto this day. And when David came to Ziglag, he sent of the spoil unto the elders of Judah, even to his friends, saying, Behold, a present for you of the spoil of the enemies of the Lord. He's, he's giving it all away here. And then the next few verses, I'm not going to read the... the uh, I'm going to skip down to verse 30. But the rest of the verses, verses he's mentioned in the towns that he gave gifts to. And then we get to verse 31. And to them which were at Hebron 
and to all the places where David himself and his men were wroth to hunt. He also sent gifts to all that helped him. When he was running away from Saul, all the people who helped him when he was running from Saul, because Saul was trying to kill him, he said, I'm giving gifts to y'all too. There was so much, they had taken so much, and David recovered all of it. He had so much, and he was giving it to everybody. He was giving it to people who helped him when he was running from Saul. He was giving it to them also. So David, he was not greedy. Christians are not greedy. What do we have? What we have, God has given to us. What money we have, God has given to us so we could not only take care of ourselves, but to help others. He did not give us money to save. That's another teaching, but I can teach that. He said, what He gives us today, we need to use for the day. He didn't give it to us to take care of ourselves tomorrow, because we might not even be here tomorrow. So He says, what I give you today, use it today. And like I said, that's another teaching, but I won't get into that. Then we're going to go to 2 Samuel, chapter 2. And in 2 Samuel, chapter 2, verse 4, David is finally, finally becomes king over Judah. He comes, becomes king over Judah. And in verse 8, Saul's son, Ezebosheth, also became king over Israel. Saul's other, Saul had a son. And he became king over Israel. Then from verses 12 to 17, they had a battle amongst each other. Judah against Israel. They had a battle against each other. And of course, David won. David's army beat the battle of Saul's son. Then we're going to drop, and I'm skipping a lot because there's just talks about battles and all that. And we're going to skip down. Then we're going to go to chapter 3. Now after, after those battles they had up there, David won. It was peaceful a while, but then they started fighting again. We'll see in chapter 3, they started fighting again. And David, David's army became stronger and stronger, and Saul's army became weaker and weaker. That's what it says. And Abner, the commander-in-chief of Saul's army, had an argument with Saul's grandson, not son, but grandson. This would be Jonathan's son. Jonathan is Saul's son, and then Jonathan had two sons. And we're going to find out all about that, okay? Try to keep up. <laughs> but the Cameron chief Abner, which was the Cameron chief when Saul had it, now he's Cameron, he's still Cameron, Cam, commander in chief, but now uh, Jonathan's son is the one who's he's the king of Israel. And he told him, and his son was, was accusing Abner of doing something with one of the handmaidens. And uh, Abner, the commander, he got very upset about it. He said, everything, every, after everything I've done for your father, Saul, you're going you're gonna to accuse me of this? So that made Abner very mad. And the commander, Abner, said, what I ought to do is go to David and give him all of Saul's kingdom. And this made Jonathan's son, I, I'm going to say Jonathan's son because I can't pronounce his name. Jonathan's son didn't say anything else. Because he was the chief. The commander-in-chief, even though he was king, commander-in-chief had a lot of power also. More over the people than the king did. Because Saul was the big king. But now it's, it's just a son and they're, he's not the mighty warrior that his father was, his great-grandfather was. Abner could have done this. In fact, he went to David and talked to David about doing that. And David agreed. And so Abner was going back to Israel to tell his men, his troops, his army, that they were going to join David. And on his way, these battles that I was talking about up here, where they, David and, and Saul's army, how they fought each other, Abner was, uh, yes, he was on his way back to get his men, his troops, to say, okay, we're going to join David. The commander-in-chief for David was Joab. Joab had a brother. Abner had killed him in one of those battles. And Joab found out that Abner was going back to Israel and so he followed him and he had him killed that's gonna come back to play okay remember that the commander-in-chief Joab for Judah killed the commander-in-chief for Israel who was under the son of Saul remember that this was Saul's grandson now let's go to chapter 4 just go there because I'm not gonna read the verses I'm just gonna tell you they had two brothers called Rechab and Banna, and they went to, to the king's house 
Saul's son, grandson, they went to his house and brought and killed him, thinking that was going to make David happy because this was he was king over Israel, David's king over Judah, and they thought if they killed the king over over Israel, this would make David happy because hey, we did because re- remember they're enemies. Judah and Israel have been fighting against each other. So these two guys thought, well, if we bring the king's head from our enemy and bring it to King David, you know, this was going to make him happy. But they were completely wrong. It made David very mad. They had, they had killed the son of Jonathan. And who's Jonathan? The Saul. Of Saul. But who else, who else is he Jonathan? Was Jonathan? He was David's blood brother. Jonathan was, had a blood covenant, a blood covenant. with David. They weren't, they weren't related, but they became blood brothers, a blood covenant, which is the same blood covenant we have with, between us and the Lord. They had, it was the same kind of covenant. It was a blood covenant. So he was not very happy because they had killed, killed Jonathan's son. And he loved, the, the Bible says, David loved, David loved Jonathan like a woman, like a man loves a woman. Doesn't mean he was gay. But that's what it says. He's just showing that David loved Jonathan very much. He was a blood brother. Now the people in the city didn't know the whole story. They thought David had him killed. They were saying David had him killed because they were, that David was afraid he might become king over Judah also. So David went over there and had him killed. Now this is what, what was spread. You know how rumors spread around. And in chapter 5, we're, gonna, we're doing a lot of skipping. But I'm going, to, I'm, going to, I'm going to connect all this together. In chapter 5, and in verse 3, after all this is going on, David becomes king over Israel. Now they, they lost their king. He was beheaded. And David finally becomes king over Israel also. So now, he's over, now he is king over Israel and Judah. And let's drop down to chapter 9. David's, David's king over all of it now, right? Now we go to chapter 9 and David wants to find out if there was any family left of Saul so he could take care of them because his, of his vow to Jonathan. Remember, John, he told, well in fact I'll read it. This is what he, uh, 1 Samuel chapter 20 verses 14 and 15. And may you treat me with, this is Jonathan talking to David. May you treat me with the faithful love of the Lord as long as I live. But if I die, treat my family with this faithful love, even when the Lord destroys all your enemies from the face of the earth. So David made this vow to Jonathan that he would take care of his family. So we're seeing right here in chapter 9 that David's wanting to find out, is there any family left? Y'all with me? He's trying to find out. One of Saul's servants that was there with David, he replied and said yes. And Jonathan has a son. And he's five years old and uh, he's crippled. That we'll find that in Second Samuel, Second Samuel chapter 4, verse 4. That he had another son and he was crippled. And the servant told David where he was at. And David sent for him and he came before David. Jonathan's son said, to, said this to David with deep respect and said, I am your servant. And David tells him in chapter, uh, verse 7, David is talking to this boy, Jonathan's son. Don't be afraid, David said. I intend to show kindness to you because of my promise to your father, Jonathan. I will give you all the property that once belonged to your grandfather, Saul, and you will eat here with me at the king's table. And the reason he had to tell him, don't be afraid, was because of the lies he heard from his grandfather about David. Chapter 4, verse 1, Saul's grandson heard about Abner being killed, which was under Saul at that time, you know, under his brother's command. They're brothers, but they're far apart. But because the rumor was going around that David killed a Jonathan son that was king, this son, this brother thought they would believe it and so now he's scared of David. He was fearing David, thinking that David was going to kill him also, because he was heir to the throne of Saul right. and Jonathan. So he was scared of him, and that's why David told him right here, don't be afraid. 
And in verse, uh, like I said, in verse chapter four, verse one, Saul's grand grandson heard about it, Abner's death, and told him that it was David's men. Like I said, and it says he became very weak from what happened. Also from him hearing about his brother being killed by those two men being beheaded, and he feared David because he thought David was going to kill him, just like he killed his brother. And because of the lies he heard, now because of this, this son of Jonathan. It's, well, no. you'll have to go through the Bible it's not right here but you'll have to read other parts of the Bible you'll find that he lived in caves for 16 years he was doing the same David did, same thing David did by running from Saul all that time David ran from Saul for, for over 10 years I forgot exactly how long but it was over 10 years well Jonathan's son has been doing the same thing he's been hiding from David for 16 years in caves now David comes to him and says, and tells him, hey, don't be afraid. Everything that belonged to them now belongs to you. And it says, and you will eat at my table, the king's table. You're going to eat at the king's table. Let's get the picture. Here we have a king, a king telling this little crippled boy, everything that belongs to me and to your grandfather and your father is yours. Not only that, you can eat at my table. King David, king over Judah, and he's a bit, he's he's a mighty king right now because he's, he's king over both nations, Israel and Judah. And he's telling this this boy that he's gonna he's gonna have everything that his father had, everything that he has. Now I love the way he responded, this little boy, because this is the way we should react when God offers us, when we give our life to the Lord. We're not just giving him our life to, to escape hell, but he tells us what, what's he doing right now? What's Jesus doing? What's he preparing for us right now? A mansion. I go to prepare a place for you. And this is, this is what our Lord is doing. He, we don't just get saved from, from, from going to hell, but the Lord's offering all this to us. The Lord is. Just like David's offering this little boy, he said, all this is yours. Everything that, that was the King Saul's, everything that was your, your uh, father's, Jonathan, and everything that is mine is yours. In verse 8, this is how the boy responded. Now, when I was teaching on blessed are they that are poor in spirit, this boy was poor in spirit. This boy was, he's just exactly like we should have been when, we gave up, when the Lord gave us this great opportunity to give our life to him. The boy says, Who am I but a servant that you should show such kindness to a dog, to a dead dog like me? This is what that boy told King David. King David offered him all this and this boy said, Who am I? Who am I? I'm like a dead dog and you're offering all this to me? That is us people. Because we're nothing but trash. We're filthy. We came from the dirt. All of our righteousness is what? It's as filthy rags to the Lord. That's us. We have a heart that's wicked continually. I mean, the Lord describes us. But all this changes once you become born again. Because He says you become a new creature. Everything changes. But that's the way we should feel. When the Lord came to us and said, Hey, I want to give you this. I want to give you life because you're dead. The Bible says you're dead. We're all dead until we give our life to the Lord. He says, you're dead. I want to give you life. Not only do I want to give you life, but I want you to live with me forever in heaven. Amen. Amen. And this is, this is what this boy says. I'm like a dead dog. I, well, you know, I don't deserve this. That's exactly how we should have reacted to the Lord. That's why I love him so much, because I knew... How Curly was. I'm not gonna say Jesse. Jesse's, Jesse's a little better than Curly, but Jesse's still bad though. But not as bad as Curly, because Curly was bad. But <laughs> but when when the Lord came, when He came to me, I'm 59. I I gave Him my life when I was 25. I'm 59 there now, and I still love Him and praise Him as much as I did back then, because I know where He took me from. And I'm like this little boy. I'm like, me? After everything, after the way I've been living and after all the things I've done, 
you're offering me this? This is the way we need to look at it. Because if you look at it this way, it'll show you where you're at. Oh, I'm not that bad. No, God says we're all wicked. Not, uh, he says our heart is wicked. Our heart. I, I love, when I read this, it was just... Amen. 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 He, told, he told Jonathan's son all about the blood covenant between him and his father. The blood. One day I'm going to teach him. I keep saying that. But one day I'm going to teach him blood covenant. Blood covenant between man and man. Blood covenant between man and woman. Blood covenant between us and the Lord. And it's all blood. And it's all, you know, it's biblical. There's blood covenants those three ways. Even between man and man. Like here. So here we have Jonathan's son. Which it goes today. Jonathan's son has a choice to make. They want to continue to live in these caves and be like a dead dog, or do I want to go live in the mansion, in the king's mansion, and eat like a king? That's the choice this boy has to make. But we make the same choice down here. When I talk to people, look, accept Jesus Christ, the one who loves you, and live forever in heaven, or don't accept him and live in hell and burn forever. It's so simple. It's so simple. There's nothing hard about it. Pick. Pick one. If you don't pick one, then you're going to hell. You're going to hell. But if you pick Jesus, this is where you're going. Amen. And you can, can you believe that people have a hard time picking between those two? Live for the Lord. Give, give the Lord your heart and go to heaven and live in a mansion forever. Or just live the way you want. Do whatever you want to do and live in hell and burn forever. You, it's your choice. I mean, that's, that's how you can approach people. That's how you can tell. I mean, we don't do it that way. We're not that blunt. Right. But that's what it is. That's the choice you're, they, they got. Just like this little boy. I mean, I'm sure he didn't say, no, I'd rather stay in the caves. No, he went and lived in the king's mansion. He made the right choice. Now, 2 Samuel chapter 9, verses, verse 9 and 10 and 13. Then the king called Zibad, Saul's servant, and said unto him, I have given unto thy master's son all that pertain to Saul and to all his house. Thou therefore and thy sons and thy servants shall till the land for him and shall bring in, shall bring in the fruits that thy master's son may have food to eat. Now this is everything that they're going to do for this little boy and his family. But Jonathan's son, the master's son, shall eat bread all, always at my table. Now Zimbad had 15 sons and 20 servants. In verse 13, so Jonathan's son dwelt in Jerusalem, for he did eat continually at the king's table and was lame on both feet. He was still crippled, but he ate the, at the king's table. It was, it was like Saul. Saul was like the devil, telling lies about David. And, and his grandson believed him. And because his grandson believed what his grandfather told him, he lived in caves. He lived in caves for most of his life. Well, not most of his life, but a good part of his life. I mean, all that time, David wanted to bless him. Amen.